Part three, section two, chapters one and two of the Origins of Christianity by Thomas Whitaker. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Von Manen on the Pauline Literature. Part three, the Epistles to the Corinthians. Section two, the Second Epistle. Chapter one, Character, Unity, Composition. Like the first epistle, the second was also, undoubtedly, meant to be taken for a letter, but here again we find that the form is not in harmony with the reality. Two persons are mentioned as the writers, namely, Paul and Timothy, and the first person plural is frequently used. Paul, however, does not take this seriously, as appears from his constant recurrence to the first person singular and in chapter 1, verse 19, he speaks of Timothy as if he stood quite outside the correspondence. Again, there is the double address. To the Corinthians, chapter 1, verse 1, chapter 6, verse 11, compare with chapter 1, verse 23, and to all the saints that are in all Achaia, chapter 1, verse 1, compare with chapter 9, verse 2, and chapter 11, verse 10. The corresponding doubleness of character is preserved all throughout, as in the case of the first epistle. Many things seem to refer to the special circumstances of a particular community. Yet, on the whole, the impression is that we are reading a small treatise, a book in the form of a letter, not a letter in the ordinary sense, destined for a particular circle of readers. Its composite character has been perceived from the time of Zimla in 1776. But we must beware of exaggerating this. The epistle is not a mere collection of fragments, genuine or otherwise, but has an undeniable relative unity. The style is throughout Pauline. Nothing of importance in the composition is of alien origin. Nothing, that is to say, is marked with any impress but that of the Pauline groups. The manner is immediately distinguishable from that of the fourth evangelist, for example, or of James, or of Clement. The points of contact can be found between later and earlier sentences. The whole, indeed, is much like a pathless thicket, in comparison with which the first epistle seems a well-ordered park, as Schmiedel has it. Yet the confusion is not absolute. There is a certain general sequence. After the opening, chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, there follows three parts devoted to separate subjects, and a conclusion, chapter 13, verses 11 through 13. The first part, chapter 1, verse 3, through chapter 7, verse 16, is an account and a defense of Paul and his work in view of the relations in which he stands to his readers at Corinth. The aim of the second, chapters 8 through 9, is to promote a collection for the saints. The third, chapter 10 through chapter 13, verse 10, takes up the cause of the apostle as against his opponents. And in somewhat more detail, it is possible to give an orderly exposition of the movement of thought. At the same time, marks of the process by which the epistle has been put together are innumerable. A. Traces of Juncture and Manipulation Neither the whole nor the parts have the kind of literary unity we expect in writings proceeding originally from a single hand. Yet the repetitions of phrases from part to part show the presence of one redactor. Apparent contradictions are sometimes due to omissions in the phrases transferred. For example, the epistle generally implies that Paul's approaching visit to Corinth is only the second, see especially chapter 1, verse 15. 
how is this to be reconciled with chapter thirteen verse one quite simply by noting the omission of part of a phrase transferred from chapter twelve verse fourteen with this omission may be compared in the second portion of chapter thirteen verse one the abbreviation of the words from deuteronomy chapter nineteen verse fifteen it is to be observed that the author repeats himself just as he quotes an old testament writer without indicating it most remarkable is the contrast of tone between the first and the third parts in the first the apostle's attitude is characteristically friendly in the third it is almost hostile yet even here the relative unity of the whole becomes manifest on closer study there are passages that are sharp in tone in the first part and in the third there are not wanting expressions of tenderness many verses in the third part are intelligible only by reference to corresponding ones in the first if the repetition in chapter two verse seventeen and chapter twelve verse nineteen is not accidental the place where the phrase is original is evidently the former passage dependence on earlier pauline writings is indicated especially by the conclusion after one word katartizesthi from chapter thirteen verse eleven referring back to an earlier verse chapter thirteen verse nine and another perhaps to the beginning of the epistle chapter one verses four and six we have others recalling passages in romans compare romans chapter twelve verse sixteen chapter fifteen verse five chapter twelve verse eighteen and chapter fifteen verse thirty three the greetings of chapter thirteen verse twelve recall romans chapter sixteen verse sixteen and first corinthians chapter sixteen verse twenty the blessing of chapter thirteen verse thirteen is that of romans chapter sixteen verse twenty and first corinthians chapter sixteen verse twenty three in an extended form b witnesses for the existence of shorter epistles the oldest and best witnesses for earlier pauline epistles is the author himself in chapter ten verses nine through eleven compare with chapter one verse thirteen this reference to epistles not merely to an epistle as in other passages shows irrefutably that for the composition of our document earlier ones of the same kind may have been used but beyond this possibility we are not entitled to go in favor of this conjecture that the second epistle to the corinthians existed in a shorter form only marcion can be cited and over and above the general argument that he was accused by the catholics of mutilating the text and hence presumably used shorter ones little can be found specifically to support the opinion that he possessed a text different from ours modern critics indeed have more and more tended to the hypothesis of composition from epistolary fragments but with little agreement in detail except that they frequently coincide in a remarkable manner as to the places where the sutures are to be found all this like the argument for two editions which may be based on the double address of the epistle in its present form offers merely general confirmation of the view arrived at by analysis that older materials have been worked up into a new whole c conclusion analysis however makes this position in itself secure no one writing an actual letter produces a composition such as we have before us the probable mode of construction from the presumed pauline materials may be illustrated by the use made of the old testament often without any sign that the writer is quoting compare for example chapter three verses seven through sixteen 
with Exodus chapter 34 verses 29 through 35, and note the literal transference of phrases along with the complex rearrangement. Again, what is given in chapter 6 verses 16 through 19, as spoken by God, is a combination of words borrowed from Leviticus chapter 26 verses 11 through 12, Isaiah chapter 52 verse 11, Zephaniah chapter 3 verse 20, Jeremiah chapter 31 verses 9 and 3, and Second Samuel chapter 7 verse 14. Still, while they throw light on the mode of composition, the nature of these citations from the Old Testament makes it clear at the same time that, in the case of lost works, there can be no reasonable hope of going beyond generalities and actually reconstructing the writings on which the redaction proceeded. 2. Whence came the epistle? Although the analysis in the case of this, as of the former epistles, in effect decides against the apostolic authorship and assigns the work with high probability to a later time than that of Paul, it seems desirable, as before, to investigate the question of genuineness anew from a different starting point. A. Improbability of the Tradition Let us consent to waive as affecting only the form, the questions why Timothy is mentioned as one of the writers, though his part in the correspondence never seriously counts, and why the epistle is said to be addressed at once to the Corinthians and to a wider circle of readers. We are still left face to face with insuperable difficulties that stand in the way of reconciling the contents with anything like the traditional assumptions. The Occasion of the Writing Commentators have not been slow to explain how Paul came to write the letter, and what its relation to the first epistle to the Corinthians, or to supposed lost epistles. He who possesses the power to create out of nothing can do wonders, and no doubt it is possible to imagine all sorts of circumstances that may have led Paul to write as he did. All the liberty of imagination that may be conceded, however, is insufficient to avoid irreconcilable contradictions between the hypotheses elaborated and the epistle as it stands. Connection with our first epistle is evident as in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 verses 18 through 21, chapter 11 verse 34, and chapter 16 verses 2 through 7, so also in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verses 1, 15, 16, and 23, chapter 2 verses 1 through 3, chapter 9 verse 4, chapter 12 verses 14 through 20, and chapter 13 verses 1 2 and 10. Paul hopes speedily to come. It is to be his second visit. Chapter 1 verse 15 and chapter 13 verse 2. The letter indicated in chapter 2 verses 1 through 11 and chapter 7 verses 7 through 16 is clearly no other than the first epistle to the Corinthians, as appears even from the verbal echoes of 1 Corinthians chapter 5. The Apostle has gone, according to his plan touched upon in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 verse 5, from Ephesus to Troas and thence to Macedonia. See 2 Corinthians chapter 2 verses 12, 13, chapter 7 verse 5, and chapter 9 verse 4. Troubled of late about the continued absence of Titus, and in connection with it about the effect of his former letter, he is now comforted. Chapter 7, verses 6 and 7. On the other hand, Titus, referred to here as a known personage, and as having reported on the effect of the former letter, chapter 7, verses 6 through 11, 
compare with chapter 2, verses 12 through 13, is not even mentioned in our first epistle. Paul, it is true, has gone to Macedonia, but not to Greece, as we should have expected from 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 5, the more so as in the meantime he has received satisfactory news from Titus. The fear of having to use sharpness, chapter 13, verse 10, can scarcely pass for a valid reason against coming, now that most have submitted. Above all, the case dealt with in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 is an entirely different one from that which is taken account of in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 verses 1 through 11 and chapter 7 verses 7 through 16. There it was for the writer Pornea of extreme gravity, and could not have been passed over so easily on the offender's repentance. In the first epistle, Paul stands entirely outside the case as a judge. In the second, the case is such that others might think it had touched him personally. Chapter 2, verse 5. The punishment inflicted in obedience to his wish, chapter 2, verses 6 and 9, cannot have been the death sentence hinted at in 1 Corinthians, chapter 5. For the person who has done the wrong, chapter 7 verse 12 is to be received again into the love of all the inducement to the writing of the apostolic letter remains unknown not because we are imperfectly informed but because the particular circumstances apparently clear as crystal are not much more than words they are rooted not directly in actual life but in younger imaginative representations of it. They lack the solidity that can only be derived from the living today or the historical past. They are wavering. The Relation Between Paul and the Corinthians Directing our attention to certain passages, we might say that the Apostle is on the best and most intimate terms with the community founded by him. But how, then, has it come about that such a vehement defense of his person and work is necessary? What has happened in the interval? We are not told, and we are no wiser for reading the epistle. Why need he remind his readers of the excellence of his life and conversation among them? Chapter 1, verse 12 and distinguish himself from the many who deal corruptly. Chapter 2, verse 17. Do they not know who he is? That, for example, he does not preach himself, but Jesus Christ. Chapter 4, verse 5. They have given full proof of their sorrow for what they have done amiss. The apostle is satisfied, and endeavors to console them in their contrition yet he does not hasten from Macedonia to his erring and now repentant spiritual children, but writes them a letter containing some of the sharpest passages of rebuke that ever came from his hand. But now the parts are reversed. It is he who has grieved them, although with the best intentions. At the same time, he tells them that he will take nothing from them, though he has taken from others to do them service. Chapter 11, verses 7 through 12, and chapter 12, verses 13 through 18. And the whole apology is for their edification. Chapter 12, verse 19, and chapter 13, verse 10. Comprehend that who can. No distinct view of the relations in question can be formed unless we are content with an arbitrary selection of single features to the complete ignoring of all the rest. If we bring together fairly all that the epistle sets before us, we cannot represent to ourselves otherwise than confusedly either the relation of the Corinthians to Paul or of Paul to the Corinthians. And this wavering character of the image derived from the whole 
is not due to our being imperfectly informed of particulars which stood plain before the eyes of writer and readers but to the mutual conflict of the particulars themselves opponents who are the opponents in view in the epistle they are generally thought to be judaizers yet not even the words law and circumcision occur sometimes indeed the author seems to have in view persons coming from outside with letters of introduction chapter three verse one by whom the other apostles are set against and placed above paul as having known christ in his earthly life and as unquestionably in the literal sense hebrews israelites the seed of abraham chapter eleven verse twenty two yet it is difficult to conceive how to the consciousness of the distant corinthians the twelve or the chief among them peter james and john could present themselves as already a closed college chapter eleven verse five chapter twelve verse eleven in comparison with whom paul the apostle of the heathen by whom their own community had been founded was nothing and in fact there are many strokes in the epistle which show the opponents of paul in quite another light than that of judaizers he has to defend himself and this in greater measure against the accusations of those opponents that he had walked according to the flesh chapter one verse seventeen and not according to the spirit they contrast his personal insignificance in the past with the weightiness of his letters chapter ten verse ten compare with chapter one verse thirteen and chapter ten verses one through six they are disobedient and regard themselves as superior to him because they have outgrown him chapter ten verses six and twelve against their presumption he appeals to the visions and revelations granted him chapter twelve verse one and sketches his triumphal march in the service of the deepest gnosis chapter two verses fourteen through sixteen these are the hyperpollinists treated already with disapproval in the first epistle now if we allow that the existence of such a group at corinth is at all intelligible after so short a time how shall we explain the way in which the author mixes them up as he does especially in chapter eleven with those who placed the great apostle behind the twelve or their heads for the false apostles of chapter eleven verse thirteen are not to be identified with the very chiefest apostles of chapter eleven verse five had paul himself been the writer he would certainly have known how to distinguish more clearly between such different classes of opponents we can understand it all only if we assume that many decades had elapsed between the foundation of the community at corinth and the writing of the epistle the author of the work chose the form of a letter but his purpose was quite other than to preserve that form with propriety what he aimed at was as a good polonist to champion the apostle at once against the advanced who contested his truly pauline character as a preacher of the new spiritual gospel and against those who out of conservatism contested his truly apostolic character as an equal of the first disciples of jesus the rest was merely clothing to furnish a pretext for the writing of what is really an apology for paul chapter twelve verse nineteen and a glorification of his career he seized upon fragments of written and oral tradition had he been a greater artist he would not have committed the faults by which he betrays his later date as it is more than sufficient signs are left to convince us 
of the incorrectness of the tradition that the epistle was written by paul about the year fifty seven or fifty eight b indications of a later time paul paul is no longer the well-known teacher and preacher with whose life among them his corinthian converts have been familiar for a year and a half the remembrance of his personality has grown dim on the one hand he can safely be placed in a new light on the other hand it is necessary to draw a picture of him for those who have neither known him nor seen him at work the founder of christian communities among the heathen has become a high authority an apostle of christ jesus by the will of god he has made to declare himself chapter one verse one his life in the world can be looked back upon as a complete whole chapter one verse twelve observe how his career is celebrated in such passages as chapter four verses eight through ten the opening of chapter six and chapter eleven verses twenty three through twenty seven signs and wonders and mighty deeds are appealed to as proofs of his right to the apostleship chapter twelve verse twelve a double tradition is now current about him on one side he is the simple preacher of the gospel who knew nothing of the advanced spiritual doctrine on the other side he is already the writer of letters circulating in his name and setting forth this doctrine the author of our epistle is thus impelled to show that the opposition between the two characters is due to a misunderstanding that it was really the same paul who preached at corinth and who composed letters to the corinthians the advanced christians of corinth were not beyond his measure in his preaching he came as far as to them also chapter ten verse fourteen he may from time to time assume a tone of self-deprecation or of pleading with his children usually he carries it as one clothed with the highest authority chapter one verse twenty three chapter thirteen verse two compare with chapter ten verse two he praises those that are obedient he stands as it were above them all upon him it is said in so many words rests daily the care of all the churches chapter eleven verse twenty eight this can seem quite simple and comprehensible only to those for whom paul has ceased to be merely an eminent man who is still of flesh and blood and has become an ideal figure absent always yet present or able to be present directing his words nominally to a single community but really to the whole of christendom the community no single feature brings before us the circle at corinth as a community just called into life a much longer existence than the five and a half years at most of the ordinary tradition is tacitly presupposed oppression has come and consolation is needed whole troops can be addressed as partakers of the sufferings of christ chapter one verses three through seven they stand fast in the faith chapter one verse twenty four they exercise discipline and are confronted with the question how far forgiveness shall be accorded to the penitent sinner chapter two verses five through eleven they give and receive letters of commendation chapter three verse one and can be described metaphorically as an epistle written in the apostle's heart known and read of all men chapter three verses two and three they are troubled by aliens to whom all sorts of mischiefs are attributed chapter two verse seventeen chapter four verse two chapter eleven verses four and twenty 
some who have undergone the influence of these have learned to respect only the older apostles to the exclusion of paul chapter eleven verse five chapter twelve verse eleven some esteem themselves superior to paul the actual teacher and respect only the paul of the epistolary literature whom they distinguish from the first some again are paulinists after the author's own heart and confess the faith in subjection chapter nine verse thirteen all this diversity well considered points to a later period than the first few years after the foundation of the community even the supposed comparison of its advantages with those of the other communities chapter twelve verse thirteen if this was ever possible in the sense intended cannot have been very early instituted doctrinal utterances here too as in the first epistle the doctrinal expressions though not very numerous give sufficient indications of a time later than that traditionally assigned to paul christianity stands over against judaism as the new against the old as that which endures against that which passes the point of view of the law is so completely transcended that its very name is not mentioned although the author does not refuse to allow the relative value of moses and makes use of the scripture the old however in his opinion is done away in christ chapter three verse fourteen equally decisive is the break with heathenism the faithful are to separate themselves from unbelievers chapter six verse fourteen through chapter seven verse one far from being still first of all or exclusively a messianic movement attached to the life and work of jesus of nazareth christianity comes forward as a new revelation the word of god chapter two verse seventeen chapter four verse two the knowledge of god chapter ten verse five the knowledge of the glory of god chapter four verse six the christian communities are god's churches chapter one verse one jesus has so long been regarded as the messiah the christ that christ has become his usual name to the knowledge of his life on earth little or no value is now attached chapter five verse sixteen he is the son of god and is preached as such chapter one verse nineteen he is god's image chapter four verse four and grace and peace can come from him as from god chapter one verse two chapter thirteen verse thirteen he is not a man who has become god but rather a god become man who being rich became poor for the sake of men chapter eight verse nine god made him to be sin for us who knew no sin chapter five verse twenty one compare with romans chapter eight verse three he has suffered and died chapter one verse five chapter four verse ten chapter five verse fifteen god has raised him up chapter four verse fourteen chapter five verse fifteen the believer is in him a new creature chapter five verse seventeen who partakes of his sufferings in order to live a new life with him those whom he has called to preach his gospel are his glory chapter eight verse twenty three they speak in christ after the lord as christ speaks in them chapter thirteen verse three their endeavor is to bring all into captivity to the obedience of christ chapter ten verse five acquaintance with gnosis is unmistakable not god but satan is the god of this world chapter four verse four the much discussed thorn in the flesh 
chapter 12, verse 7, which evidently means some bodily suffering, is called a messenger of Satan. God is nowhere said to be the cause of physical evil. The Apostle's prayer to the Lord, that is, to Christ, that he, that is, the messenger, might depart from him, chapter 12, verse 8, implies that the Lord, as in the Gospels, has power to cast out demons. Paul's recognition, after the failure of his request, that the buffeting is for his good, does not mean that it comes directly from God. The contrary is asserted. The antitheses of Gnosticism are found, flesh and spirit, and so forth. For others in rapid succession, see chapter 6, verses 14 through 15. Observe the high esteem in which visions and revelations are held, chapter 12, verse 1, and the making light of tradition, chapter 5, verse 16. The strong anti-Judaism of chapter 3, verses 6 through 18, is, of course, Gnostic. Knowledge is glorified, chapter 11, verse 6, and is placed side by side with faith and utterance, chapter 8, verse 7. Many special modes of expression also are strongly Gnostic. The Collection The indeterminateness of the references to the contribution for the saints, chapters 8 and 9, shows that the author does not live in the surroundings which, as Paul, he presupposes. We learn neither who those saints are, nor what is their especial claim. The particulars with which he tries to clothe his general exhortations to liberality are uncertain, wavering, and scarcely compatible mutually. The whole is intelligible only if we suppose that he had heard or read of a collection made by Paul for the Christians at Jerusalem, in return for which the apostle had received blame instead of thanks. This he makes a peg on which to hang a vindication of the authority of Paul, and to commend to his readers the example of liberality to needy brethren on other parts of the world set by the Macedonians, Corinthians, and Achaeans of the early time. Such expressions as those of chapter 8, verse 18, and of the next verse, furnish by themselves a sufficient proof that the years in which the gospel was first preached are in the past. Special Points Other attempts at detailed circumstance are of the same kind. Observe how the figure of the person mentioned in chapter 2 verses 1 through 11 floats in the vague. He is presented to the reader merely as anyone, such a one. In short, he is a type. The author is not concerned with him in particular, but with the question for the present and the future, how to deal with a penitent sinner. The same is true of his double, the person that had done the wrong, chapter 7, verse 12, of the matter that was its subject, and of him that suffered wrong, See chapter 7, verses 6 through 16. The so-called historical background is a hypothetical case, nothing more. Book of Acts The use of a written gospel cannot be demonstrated, though the words of chapter 1, verse 17, suggest Matthew chapter 5, verse 37. And the reference to the meekness of Christ in chapter 10 verse 1 recalls matthew chapter 11 verse 29 while the words borrowed from chapter 13 verse 1 from deuteronomy chapter 19 verse 15 are rather closer to matthew chapter 18 verse 16 than they are to the septuagint on the other hand dependence on acts of paul as in the first epistle is unmistakable this is shown by the agreements with our canonical acts of the apostles, 
taken along with the deviations for the phenomena are explicable by supposing use of the same underlying document the escape from damascus for example is described somewhat differently in second corinthians chapter eleven verses thirty two and thirty three and in acts chapter nine verses twenty three through twenty five the lists of afflictions undergone by paul second corinthians chapter six verses four and five chapter eleven verses twenty three through twenty eight finds no satisfactory explanation in the canonical acts these however are perhaps also in great part independent of the acts of paul in them we may see another retrospect of the great combatant's life after its completion c attempts at parrying difficulties to meet objections against the pauline authorship an extension of the lapse of time between the two epistles from half a year to a year and a half has been proposed by means of this and similar suggestions and by expulsion of supposed interpolations some difficulties might be removed but the negative case as a whole is left substantially unaffected the hypothesis of construction from fragments on whole or in part pauline does not save the genuineness of the epistle as it stands and at best it can meet only the objections that have reference to the form while the most important part of the case rests on the contents till something of more positive value is advanced in favor of the traditional view we may without further attention to it go on to inquire into the origin of the epistle d conjectural mode of origin the author and his aim the author was probably a greek by birth and not a jew by inadvertence he makes paul speak of jews chapter eleven verse twenty four as if he were not a jew himself in no quotation of his from the old testament is acquaintance with the hebrew text presumable he uses the greek of the septuagint that his mind had been formed under the influence of jewish modes of thought and expression is merely a part of the christian development in general and does not distinguish him among the paulinists his position is to the right rather than to the left he does not reject the other apostles in the name of paul though in his estimation paul stands higher he places the new or christian dispensation above the old or mosaic but without expressing hostility to the law as such he is content that it should be regarded as a passing phase which the jews cannot understand because they take it to be permanent his aim is to champion his paul the epistle may be called an apology for paulinism as the author conceives it as paul he assures his readers that he is not engaged with commending himself while in fact he is doing nothing else but that he is providing them with matter for boasting in him chapter five verse twelve all this pleading for the authority of the apostle however has a practical aim the writer possesses letters circulating in the name of paul but they seem to him to need supplementing otherwise he would not have attempted a new composition the way in which he tries to improve on the material in his hands is well seen in the case of church discipline this is to be maintained to that purpose he had read first corinthians chapter five at the same time he desired to show that there were cases in which it might be applied in a less rigorous manner in the light of this softening tendency we can read with intelligence the passages already discussed that bear on the repentant sinner relation to the first epistle 
this example is instructive also because it clearly shows that the author of the second epistle was acquainted with the first but that he was not the person from whose hand it proceeded he attaches himself to it and is dependent on it as is evident from innumerable points of contact his epistle however has a character of its own it does not like the first present the appearance of a series of small treatises but while resembling it in its discontinuous movement is in the main a vindication of paul's person for the edification of the community that is in reality of any christian community without local reference acquaintance with the first epistle to the corinthians renders acquaintance with romans likely and this likelihood is confirmed by comparison of particular passages determination of date the close relation to the first epistle makes the conclusion safe that the second was written not long after it the author finds himself in the same circumstances of contention he too lives in those days of the development of paulinism which preceded the recognition of paul outside the circles of the heretics and the taking up of the apostle into the broad stream of the growing catholic church with this approximation to the date the external evidence is in agreement confirmation of the general view is found in the apology of aristides that apology written probably between a d one twenty five and one thirty shows acquaintance with the pauline writings especially with the epistle to the romans christianity as in the epistles has become detached from judaism yet paul is not mentioned the earliest missionary activity among the heathen is ascribed to the twelve this silence about paul is unintelligible in a resident at athens as aristides is said to have been if the author of the epistles was really the founder of the first christian communities in greece end of the origins of christianity with an outline of von manen's analysis of the pauline literature by thomas whittaker recorded for librivox by joe dickerson may 2012